Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Our readings for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 18th, 2024, begin with Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Our semi-continuous reading uh, continues in 1 Kings, the second chapter, Uh, There it will be verse 10 and 12, and then we'll skip over to chapter 3, reading 3 through 14. Our psalm is number 34, verses 9 through 14. Our epistle is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. And our gospel continues in John chapter 6, and now we're at verse 51. And Caroline... You held us off on verse 51 last week so that we can begin with it this week as we look at 51 through 58. Yes, I did. That was my suggestion because you really have, a again, a, a new move on the part of Jesus. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, so making more connections there. Uh, I am the living bread, and now, now the bread that came down from heaven— Uh, who eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So that's the, that's the big move here, the big change, the big offering. And, uh, and when we get to the pericope next, the, that finishes out the bread of the bread of life discourse, uh, it becomes one of the reasons why many of the disciples say this is difficult. Who can accept this? And so, <laughs> which is probably like the biggest understatement of the Bible, but uh, this is difficult. The question is, what's this? But that's for next week. But th- we really have the, the most, uh, where Jesus is most directly, uh, you really eliminating any of the third person, really eliminating, you know, any, any sort of uh, mediators of what he is offering. He's offering him very, his very self, my own flesh and my own blood, my um, incarnated, but also divine self. And so the, uh, the tendency is to get really hung up on the flesh and the blood and, and what, what all that's about. And Matt's like, yeah, <laughs> but I, uh, but again, if you can, if you can take that as a, I think anyway, as a another way to emphasize and underscore the incarnation, I think that's what's you know the the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and so that's really what 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 Jesus is offering here. So I think uh, you, yeah, this is this is when Jesus is being as pretty much as plain as he can possibly be in the gospel of John. And it's in that, it's in that plainness or it's in that, it's in that offering of his entire self that there's the resistance. You think this is as plain as he can be? (laughs) That just terrifies me. (laughs) It's pretty straight. It's plain and that it's pretty straightforward. You know, Um, it's me. Correct. Yeah. That, that way. It's simply and straightforward. No, it's not plain. And it's not that plain does not be understandable, but. um, (laughs) (laughs) But Obviously, Matt and I were thinking understandable when you said plain. No. Mm -mm. (laughs) Although in my head, I'm trying to think of a clearer part and I'm just coming up blank. So, (laughs) well, what one of the things that I thought about this particular and Caroline, you've brought this up before. And it's one of the things that sticks in my mind is um, and this was when you anticipated this text a few weeks ago. Jesus has had similar conversations with Nicodemus at night, with the woman at the well in midday, and here with the gathering of the community. And I'm going to call them the gathering of the community. John refers to them as the Jews, uh, but we're reminded that this is the community of the people that God has made this promise to that will be a blessing to all the nations. And we know that this is where the promise starts and that there are among these Jews, this first community, those who accept who 
trust in Jesus. Um, and I just pause to say that. So uh, uh, particularly in the moment that we're in now that people don't get to this, well, the Jews don't understand and take this in some anti-Semitic way. Um, this is the same conversation that seems so clear to us, uh, be born again. I am, uh, uh, drink from me and you'll never thirst again. Eat from me and uh, um, uh, you'll be filled. And now flesh, my flesh, my body. Um, it is very clear if we get away from our trying and our understanding of good and evil and to go back to what we spent so much time with last week. This is about life. This is about life, uh, the, the life that God has promised that has been made in Jesus. And it is us turning to accept this, even when it's not so plain, unless we receive it on God's terms. It seems to me that, um, oh man, I'm not trying to pick a fight here. But it seems that the clearest part of this text is that it's it's it reflects a kind of sacramentology of some kind. It mm -hmm. seems that we, based on kind of where we've moved from eating to eternal life, that now it's this idea of how do you participate with Jesus now and like the here and now. Mm -hmm. And part of that is in some ways, I think maybe communalized perhaps around Christians gathering together to eat together. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's just like the Lord's Supper and the Last Supper in the synoptic tradition. I'm not saying that. But right. doesn't there have to be something here about the way in which this, partation, this participation with Jesus is becoming kind of ritualized? That's what I mean by when I say sacramentalized. Like mm. that it's perhaps located in a communal sharing of life with Jesus that's also centered largely around food and shared meals. Is that possible? Before you answer, Caroline, because you're going to give the right answer, I'm going to throw something out. <laughs> I'm going to throw something out there, Matt, that your question and the way that you 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 presented it made me begin to think. And, and I don't know, I, don't, I just, when we think of um, sacraments, uh, particularly those of us who are, are are more what would be the high church, where we actually you know take communion more often uh, than once a month and and, and um, uh, uh, attend to baptism and in 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 those quote unquote rituals as you did as you mentioned. For some reason or another, when you phrased the question, what came to my mind was uh, the sacrament of our very living. And, and it, it was marked around what you said about communal, our communal lives. And maybe I'm anticipating uh, Ephesians uh, uh, that we'll be reading in, uh, as the uh, other text uh, from the New Testament this week and have already been in. But this reality that it's not just the ritual practices of the gathered community, it's the practices of our lives when we leave the sanctuary and we enter into the world and we actually practice hospitality so that it's not the wafer and the shot glass, it's actually the meal, the table spread for others. Um, so I'm, I'm taking that communal, community idea and hospitality and I'm making the sacrament, not the ritual in the church, but the practices of the church in the world. Okay, fix me, Caroline. Maybe. I mean, I just would say that's, I'm coming out, I think, more from a New Testament point of view, which is that almost every New Testament writing has got concerns about communal eating uh, in one way, shape, or form, and that this is, there's not so much a sanctuary, it's just this is what people do. This is a mark of being within this church, and that communal eating is a sign of deep communal intimacy as also, as well as potential for offense and for and for difficulty but i mean how that gets mapped out in the different a but absolutely. we're probably both wrong absolutely yeah that's why i'm jumping in before caroline corrects us uh, absolutely so matt because when you say sacrament i think this you've rubbed off on me because when you say sacrament i I very easily get into ecclesial rituals, but you've spoken so repeatedly. Yeah. 
I know you don't. And and when I heard you, you spoken so much about communal practices that I immediately went there. I immediately checked myself against the sacramental rituals into that first century reality of what it means to sit down at table with them. Mm-hmm. Because that yeah, for people who don't know, I'm pretty I'm pretty Zwinglian at the end of the day. But uh, <laughs> last week I talked about cake over pie. Now I'm talking about Zwingli over Calvin and Luther. I'm going to get myself in huge Midwestern trouble. Anyway, Caroline, are you still <laughs> on the podcast? <laughs> I I'm just listening, and no, no I I think it, I I would not. I have no interest in uh, correcting either one of you or. Uh, I, I think I so think hard all of that. these reflections. <laughs> I think all of these reflections. What that what they point to, I is an important aspect of this of the bread of life discourse, which I talked about at the very beginning. That you know whether or not this is a you know a, the beginnings of some kind of you know some kind of sacramental gathering together of the Christian community uh, is it, it, certainly one could say that. I think the, the what's what, what I find interesting is how does something like this then shape our understanding of the Lord's Supper or the the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? How does it how does it influence our own sacramentology in ways that we haven't thought about before? And I mentioned this earlier about the fact that that these moments of Jesus hosting a meal uh, here and then in John 21 are not, again, connected to the night he was betrayed, but in the middle of his life, and particularly the abundance of life that he's offering here and then again in John 21. And so how does that offer some, you know, nuances or subtleties with regard to our expectations of what happens at the Lord's Supper. Uh, I I think another clue to all of this might be verse 56, uh, because, and some scholars will even say that this is really the heart of the fair, of the uh, Bread of Life discourse. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. That that's, that this whole meal is pointing toward, or this whole discourse and the meal itself is pointing toward a kind of sharing with Jesus that is even beyond sharing. It's that abiding, it's meno, it's John's favorite word. And so it's relationship. And I, and so it, it ends up being, this this verse ends up being sort of the pinnacle of the of and to what extent that's you know that's what they that's what is difficult of imagining you know abiding with Jesus and I and them of course we'll get that way more when we get into the farewell discourse but there's it is uh, again going kind of to the plain not so plain. <laughs> <laughs> but it it really is that connection. This is what this is what I'm offering in this. I'm offering myself, my very self, and all of myself. I'm holding nothing back. I so that you can know me as deeply as I want to know you, and I know you already. So um I think the commentary yeah. also helps with that in terms of this enduring. It talks about uh, the remaining. Um so it's, uh I just uh would Turn our readers to to look at 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 what uh, Peter Edger has has shared in the commentary on that as well. And I would say one more thing, and then we really need to move on. But we have um, the bread the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Um, we want to hold on to that because when we get to the final portion of the discourse, we have give but paradidomi, and it's used. You know that that. Uh, of of an introduction to Judas and um so anyway hold on to that <laughs> but uh the proverbs text is uh the proverbs text of course is is underscoring that setting the table right so here right. you have wisdom being the host of a banquet and uh so you have have that connection there uh <clears throat> but Obviously, you can do Proverbs all, all on its own as well. So, It's lovely that the Proverbs text was chosen for this week. And in terms of 
of talking about how God's feeding also happens through wisdom. Um, I, I wouldn't, as a preacher, I wouldn't want to spend a lot of time talking about wisdom imagery in John, although I know it's there. We know it's there. Yeah. But to talk about the various ways in which God nurtures going beyond the miraculous. And sometimes it's in more real life lived experiential ways, flesh and blood ways, one might even say, uh, like the experience of wisdom and what that means for kind of practical wisdom and practical um, ways of living. Just again, to show that it's not just simply about food that suddenly appears before you and that, you know, whether it's in the Exodus or in the, in the context of the feeding in John six, and just to spend a little bit of time with that, right. About how God's God is known and how God sustains in a variety of ways. Which is something that Psalm speak, speaks to as well. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So that's the way I would bring, and especially coming off of 34, eight, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So this Psalm is, is, uh, yeah. is underscoring, underscoring yeah. the theme that you just said, um, Matt. Joy, Even gonna- lions get hungry, the young ones, and they're <laughs> fast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, agreeing like with both of you of the setting of the table and in this idea of wisdom, this provision of God and and God um, uh, uh, giving us, um, and I'll say it this way, more than we ask, but all that we need. And so the segue I was going to make is that this also would work with the first kings um, uh, as mm-hmm. we turn to mm-hmm. Solomon and, and mm-hmm. begin to, to recognize uh, that uh um, I, getting deep into uh, uh, where the story lands, the familiar story of, of Solomon asking uh, for wisdom to lead his people and God providing more than that. Yeah, that is most certainly a connection you could make with the first Kings, with Proverbs, and even with Ephesians, even with mm-hmm. the Ephesians text. Of, exactly. Live not as unwise people, but as wise people. And you um, get these final five final admonitions from um, the letter of Paul or the letter of Ephesians. So yeah, that's certainly, certainly a connection you can make, but mm-hmm. yes. So first Kings. Solomon's King now. <laughs> David died. Uh, we don't learn why, but there's some intrigue why Solomon is chosen. Um, you might want to read that. And then, yeah, this is kind of where Solomon still looks good here at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Although verse three, it's always like Solomon loved the Lord. He walked in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. You know, oh, there just, was that <laughs> a little foreshadowing. But yes. uh, you know, we're going to in the coming Sundays, we're going to see Solomon's reputation for wisdom with mm-hmm. uh, with a reading from um, this is still two weeks out with uh, Song of Solomon, and then some readings from Proverbs. So you'll kind of get a sense of his his what's i guess his reputation is the best word for that mm-hmm. worth noting is uh individually uh as well as collectively the people of god um uh, start off right but it's something that uh if we uh pay attention to what we've just uh highlighted with the new testament readings with uh, uh well with all of the previous readings uh, but particularly with john uh, that this is about abiding. This isn't about making one statement of faith or one commitment on one day. Uh, so yes, what we have here is uh, um, a good moment of Solomon making the right choice. But we know that all of Solomon's choices were not wise. Uh, and they were because he stepped outside of trusting God. And so individually, as well as collectively, the people of God always have to abide in, in, in abide with God uh, for faithfulness of our own character. But it's, a, it's an admirable request. Oh my gosh, isn't it? And, <laughs> and again, demonstrates the character of God to say, I'm, I'm going to go back to Genesis, you know, choose life choose the knowledge of good and evil? Why choose the relationship with God? Let's choose the knowledge of good and evil so we can be like God. Mm-hmm. And here is a hint. If you'd chosen life, you'd have gotten wisdom. I just love that. You know, you know if, if, if you've chosen, excuse me, if you've chosen life, you'd have gotten knowledge. 
And so here we have uh, this admirable choice of Solomon, where he, for the sake of his people, it's not a selfish request. It's for the sake of his leadership, for the sake of his kingdom. And uh, we need leaders like that, but we need them to endure with that attitude, not just be caught up in the gifts that they have received and go, oh, this is, this is pretty plush. That's where the fall it's not, it's not often that it's not often one of the three wishes that you ask the genie in the bottle. That's for sure. So <laughs> I, I've heard this taught though, but if you ask for a, you know, a mind of knowledge and discernment, you'll get rich too. It's just oh, kind of the bonus. No. So. There's always a way to get it back to that. Isn't there? Uh, isn't I know it's just kind of crass to ask for riches. So the, the sneaky way to ask for riches is to ask for a discerning mind. And then, yeah, then you get both. Yeah, uh, I have actually heard it taught that way before. And, uh, oh, oh, not recommending. Which is why that, it is but... so important to pay attention to what are the consequences of the actions when we turn away from. Correct. Which is why wise and discerning preachers come here to sermon brainwave for their. That's um, right. That's we can't right. promise you wealth. But we can. <laughs> we can promise you some wisdom and discernment, modicum amount of both. Correct. Correct. Just don't threaten to cut any babies in half. Is my first bit of advice. People are like, what is he talking about? Read, read First Kings. Keep reading. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, Ephesians. Uh, I, I mentioned it earlier, but you have this section, uh, chapter five, one through twenty. This final, final groups of group of um, instruction uh, coming from Ephesians. But once again, I would, uh, I. I've been saying this all along, but is there a way that you can work this in as a, a particularly depending on what direction you go for the, uh, for your sermon, uh, is there a way to use this liturgically? Be careful how you live and, but as wise people. <laughs> and, and I'll, anyway, and I'll, that's my instruction on the instructions. On the instructions, your consistency for these, uh, as we've moved through uh, the letter to uh, uh, the Ephesians, you've 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 been consistent, Caroline, and and so I'll 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 do that in the same and say these are difficult instructions. This is a difficult way of living. It's difficult, not because uh, not because it's really pie in the sky, because it's not. It's difficult because it's countercultural. It's not what the world is doing. It's not what the world is getting away with. And um, it, it, it makes it a difficult way. So uh, the life of Solomon, uh, it was a difficult choice because, yeah, you're supposed to ask for riches, not wisdom, especially not wisdom in your leadership. Well, what does it mean to be a follower and have life? It, it means that you're, you're going to practice differently. Um, not as unwise people as wise people. So be careful how you live. And then this, the practices that Ephesians gives us are very specific. When I teach Ephesians, which I do like once a year, um, sometimes twice, uh, I often hear from students about how influential this part of the letter is, and then especially the armor of God, which will come up mm -hmm. uh, next week, I think in various circles. This this. And I'll say more about the armor of God next week. But people have heard of these passages. Some people have. And some have been really like uh, whipped into a frenzy by them in other churches and other kinds of ways of understanding them. And so even this line about the days being evil and seeing the world as a fundamentally unsafe and untrustworthy place, which is probably true at one level, but not to turn that into... Uh, trying to figure out who your enemies are and trying to identify, you know, who's on the right side and who's on the wrong side. Um, it, it's, so just, it's worth this talking about. It's worth taking this passage seriously where it talks about the days being evil and helping to ask, well, what does it look like to live in light of that in ways that are responsible in ways that make you a good neighbor, but in ways that aren't naive um, as well. Um I don't know what that would look like in your context, but just kind of a, say, a way of say, sometimes these passages like this at the end of a letter get short shrift and get skipped over uh, too quickly. And these are um, influential verses. And really, really 
clear because what it is, is it's, as you said, Matt, it's not looking for who is the bad guy. It's an invitation to be uh, a godly person. So it's, it's recognizing the reality of the moment we're living in and living not like everybody else, not as the unwise, but living this way because this is the way of the wise. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.